Welcome to JLive. I'm J Arts Executive Director, Laura Mandel, and it's great to be with you for JLive. This is our series of virtual cultural experiences that bring us together to explore and celebrate the diverse world of Jewish art, culture, and creative expression. We're bringing you bite-sized conversations with the best Boston area talent. Today, I'm especially excited to be with Simona Dineppi, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Curator of Judaica at the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. Hi, Simona. Hi, Laura. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So today, we are lucky to be getting a fascinating in-depth look at a single piece of Judaica in the MFA's Judaica collection. So I will let Simona share it all with you. Um, but if you have questions during the conversation, please share them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screens, and I will ask as many of the questions as time allows. So Simona, tell us. So for this afternoon, I chose this elegant silver cup made in um, mid 18th century Paris, which is on view when the museum is open on our main floor. And uh, I chose it for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, because it's one of the highlights of the gift that we received in 2013, seven years ago now, from the Charles and Lynn Schusterman collection of Judaica. Secondly, because I found in my research that it is surprisingly connected to other artworks in the MFA holdings. And thirdly, because it illustrates how uh, some works really through time go through what I like to call a metamorphosis and they change use and function and interpretation. So um, we'll see um, how. Uh, now the silver marks on the bottom of the cup, and I'm sorry that I can't show them to you, tell us that it was made in Paris in 1722. Uh, however, the engravings on the body of the cup, both on the front and the, the other side, um, take us to a very different place and time. So you can see that on the right, on your right, you see an inscription in Hebrew uh, that says, remember the Shabbat and keep it holy to Shlomo Ansen from his rabbi on the 6th of Shvat, 5,576, which corresponds to our 5th of February, 1816. And so who is this um, Shlomo Ansen? This is the first question that the Sotheby's experts must have asked themselves because this was um, sold um, at an auction in Tel Aviv in 1995, if I remember correctly. So the answer to this question, um, lies on the opposite side because we see the coat of arms of the Rothschild family. So Anson was in fact Anson Salomon von Rothschild who lived in the 19th century in Frankfurt first and then Vienna where he was called to lead the um, uh, Viennese branch of the Rothschild family bank and he turned that bank into the largest bank in the uh, Austro-Hungarian um, empire. But then when I started to study the object, I asked myself, why would a rabbi um, give this object to uh, Anselm von Rothschild? So I thought perhaps because of an act of philanthropy um, in favor of the Jewish community, uh, but that's not it. Um, so it, the answer was very easy to find because looking at the biography of Anselm von Rothschild, I found that he was born on, in 1803, that is 13 years earlier than the year on the cup. Not only that, he was born on the 29th of January, uh, 1803, which corresponds in Hebrew calendar to the 6th of Shvat. So basically, the date on the cup is the exact date of its birthday, 30, its 13th birthday. Um, this tells us that it was essentially a gift uh, that the rabbi gave to Ansen for, for his bar mitzvah. Um, and it was sort of, a, it was a gift, but it was also reminding him, now you're an adult, now that you have the same responsibilities that your father and I do, you have to follow all the commandments, especially the fourth commandment of the Tablets of the Law, 
keep the Shabbat. So it was a, a sort of a, a significant uh, gift. And what I love about this object, and if we go on to the next uh, slide, please, is that from a um, sort of um, mid 18th century Parisian beaker made for secular use, um, it transformed in a, a century later into a Jewish ritual object, a kiddush cup, used at the Rothschild Shabbat table um, on Friday night. And I'm showing you this slide because the beaker on the right, which will be soon in a new gallery at the MFA, the French Salon, devoted to uh, French silver of the 18th century, shows you a, a secular, beautiful, highly decorated beaker, Paris, middle of the 18th century. And I just wanted to show you how similar it is with the same bell shape and um, gadrun, um, I think that's the term, um, based. Um, what I'm trying to say is that, as it is often the case with Judaica, um, Judaica objects are not always created as Jewish objects. They become that with, with time, if you add a Hebrew inscription or a Jewish motif. And that is especially the case for objects like candlesticks and cups, certainly not for Hanukkah lamp or Rimonim or Torah finials. Therefore, whenever an object is not intrinsically Jewish in, in form, um, it can become uh, so later in time, it can be transformed. That's what I mean by metamorphosis. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So um, as I carried out research into Anselm von Rothschild, I decided to um, just type his name in our website, the, the regular website that you all have access to. And I was very excited to see that these three works appeared on the screen. These are three works that not only were in his collection, works at the MFA, uh, very different, but also all of exceptionally high quality uh, in their genre. So these three works appeared because he purchased uh, these three artworks. He was an art collector, um, and I can tell you more about his collection. So first of all, it's wonderful how from a kiddush cup that came into the museum only seven years ago, we can now connect it to these masterpieces in, of different kind, different type. So let me tell you a bit about these three words. Um, they, are, they very conveniently illustrate for us the three main interests that Anselm had as a collector. So his first love were miniatures, um, and you see here on the right, a miniature portrait on ivory of Swedish King Gustav III. And I wanted to read you very briefly a quote from his diaries, from Anselm von Rothschild diaries, when he says, the older I get and the grayer I get, the more I love these delightful miniature objects with their uncomplicated pleasures. So that was his real authentic club. However, his art advisor, who was none other than, next slide please, the Jewish painter Moritz uh, Daniel Oppenheim, also often called by art historian the first Jewish painter because he, he was the first Jewish painter in Germany to be academically trained and to practice the profession successfully, uh, of painter, and I'm showing you here uh, a beautiful picture at the Jewish Museum in New York, showing uh, the sun that comes back to from war to he, to I think during a Shabbat to his uh, observant family, and it's lovely just to see those same Jewish ritual items that we're now collecting. You see the hanging Shabbat lamp that was used before candlesticks became a, a, a custom. And I think 
that uh, on the wall, uh, no, maybe it's not a Hanukkah lamp. In any case, you see the Shabbat lamp. So if we go back to the previous slide, Morris Daniel Oppenheim thought that miniatures were not worthy uh, to collect. So he uh, managed to um, convince uh, Ansen to start to buy and collect oil paintings which he believed were the, the best thing in the market. And so I'm showing you on the left hand side this theatrical still life in architectural setting, which is also on view in our Evans wing. When we reopen, it will be um, on view. And uh, indeed, Ansem continued to collect and buy Dutch paintings, but Dutch 17th century paintings, the golden age of Dutch uh, painters. And we know that at his death, he had 116 uh, Dutch oil paintings. Um, the object in the center, perhaps my favorite, is this delightful uh, glass bottle painted in enamel with a poem in French about love, uh, made in France in the middle of the 16th century, also on view in our Kunstkammer um, room uh, on the main floor. And this really uh, shows his love of decorative Renaissance um, objects. Uh, now, if we go on to, oh, before, before we go on to the next slide, what's also important about these three pieces, it, they were all looted in 1938 from the Vienna residence of Baron Alphonse and Clarice von Rothschild. They were, they were retrieved by Allied forces after the war. Uh, and um, the, the two on the left sort of ended up in the open market, whereas the one on the right was always kept with the Rothschild family. And he came to us as a gift five, uh, five years ago. So we can go on to the next slide, please. This is the picture I've already shown you. And now we are on the website of the British Museum in London. Because um, as proud as I may be of those four works that we have that were in Ansem's collection, th the most notable um, artworks uh, that were in his collection are at the British Museum in London and form part of the Wadston bequest that also has a dedicated display at the British Museum. Um, there are, um, it's a treasure trove of 300 precious gold and silver objects, some purchased by Anselm, others by his son Ferdinand, who continued the collection and eventually uh, donated it, bequeathed it to the, um, to the BM, to the British Museum uh, when he died. Um, what you see on the right hand side is probably the most famous piece that was purchased by Anselm himself is the Holy Thorn Reliquary um, made in, in about 1400 um, for a, a French Duke and then it entered the collection of Charles V. Um, so if I speak of Ferdinand, his son, who didn't like his father very much, if we believe his letters, we go on to the next uh, slide, please. Ferdinand James uh, is considered today the real sort of celebrated star uh, uh, of the Rothschild collectors because he built uh, what you see on the screen is Watson Manor, this extraordinary mansion in Buckinghamshire that is open to visitors. It's essentially the Rothschild private collection the palace was built by Ferdinand, Anselm's son, and it was filled with works of art that he collected. He had a weakness for French 18th century paintings and decorative arts. It's, it's just an astounding place. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. So we have Ferdinand, uh, who's famous as a collector, and then we have uh, Anselm's wife, Charlotte Rothschild, she was his first cousin, 
from the London branch of the family. And because he was in the will of the pa patriarch of the Rothschilds that they had to marry between first cousins, that's what they did. And Charlotte or Chile Rothschild, you see on the left in a lovely portrait by Thomas Lawrence that is kept at Watson Manor, she was not only a wonderful collector, but a wonderful artist and the most famous a painter, a very fine painter. The most famous work that she did is now in a private collection in Zurich, the Braginsky collection of Hebrew illuminated manuscripts. And uh, it is um, an illuminated Haggadah, uh, painted in about 1842 the only Agada known to have been illuminated by a woman. So that's significant, that's meaningful. She painted the scene and a German scribe uh, wrote the Hebrew and the German translation. So I'm showing you here a scene of the Israelites in the desert looking up um, at uh, Mount Sinai where we can see in the distance um, Moses receiving the tablets uh, of the law. Uh, and if you notice, it has the figures at this Raphaelesque, uh, really Renaissance inspired um, um, sort of style. I want to show you a few more, a couple of more pages from the Agada because it's very beautiful. So if we go on to the next slide, it's the 10 plagues in this you know, sort of this architecturally designed um, central uh, niche with the, some medallions uh, all around it, illustrating the ten, uh, the ten plate. And on the left hand side, she uh, painted uh, the four sons. So you see Chacham, Rasha, etc., etc. I think, let's see if we have another slide. We may not. No, that's it. That's the end. I just have Go to say back. that is my favorite image of the four sons. I've never seen anything quite like that. So the, the evil one is a soldier, right? <laughs> the evil one is a soldier. Wow. So I, I really hope that one day we can borrow this illuminated manuscript from the Braginsky collection in Zurich. Um, that is entirely devoted to illuminated, Hebrew illuminated uh, manuscripts. So I think uh, any questions that you have on the Kiddush Cup or, uh, or Anselm as a collector, uh, I'd be happy to answer. That we're talking about a, a Kiddush Cup and a Jewish family, and yet so much of the artwork you just showed us and what they collected is either Christian iconography or things that are really sort of verging on that question of assimilation and what does it mean to be Jewish. Um, and I'm kind of curious, can you speak a little bit to that? Yes, I think in general, I would say that Viennese Jews, uh, like German Jews, especially of the really highest the social. Uh, status that you can think of were fairly, fairly assimilated. We know that in, uh, in specifically in Anselm's collection, there were also three Madonnas, uh, three oil paintings mm. of the Virgin Mary that he collected. I've read that apparently towards the end of his life, he got cozy with Catholicism. I don't know if that's true. Mm. I haven't looked into it too much. And I don't even know that that is necessary uh, to justify a love for religious Christian pictures, which, which European Jews bought and studied um, and loved um, without having to convert to Catholicism. Some of really the greatest art, European art historians of late medieval and uh, early Renaissance Christian material are Jewish, in particular German Jews. Mm -hmm. So both collectors and art historians. It's really interesting. So we have some questions from the audience and the first is actually a pretty basic one, which is on the Rothschild cup, there's an H that we see stamped. Um, what does that stand for, do you know? 
So I anticipated this question, and in, in spite of the fact that I anticipated this question, I don't have an answer. I'll tell you, you why. You didn't tell me not to ask it. <laughs> no, no, I anticipated this question when I previously gave this, uh, I anticipated this question to the previous talk that I gave on this subject, and I, I, I talked to our expert, uh, Tom Mickey, uh, of, of decorative arts and of silver, and I was asking in particular, about that H that is visible, because the actual marks that pertain to Paris 1722 and initials of a maker that we haven't identified are on the bottom of the cup. Uh, that H, I asked him, uh, and we are not sure. It's probably not, um, it's not French. Um, the, the, it, it wouldn't be a French mark. So what we presume is perhaps it's a mark that was uh, done later uh, in Germany when, when the cup arrived in Germany. But if I'm wrong, I know that we have here my colleague Courtney Harris and um, you know, maybe she has another uh, idea, but, but that's, what, um, that's what I was told. Great. And there's actually a follow-up question, which is about the marks. Um, since we can't see the bottom of the piece, can you describe what the marks on French silver would look like? And are they like English silver or are they different? They're different. English silver is probably the most generously marked silver. It has a lot of, of marks, so it's, it's very helpful uh, to date. Um, this one has three, if I remember correctly, it has three marks. One is the a tax mark, so of whenever the year when it was taxed. Another one is uh, the essay mark, which tests the content of silver. And then a third one is uh, the maker's mark, his initials. I seem to re remember IBD, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, and, and so that those are the, I tried to find an image of the marks, but I couldn't uh, find it on, uh, to put it on the slides. So speaking of things online or on slides, there's actually a question of, can the Zurich exhibition of the Haggadah be seen online? And if so, can we uh, find yes. the link? Let me see live. Great. Let's do this live, okay? Um, I'm typing. Uh, you can see, in fact, you can browse and scroll uh, the book um, in mm. a very helpful way and zoom in uh, at Great. high, there it is, at high um, resolution. I am now copying for you uh, in the chat uh, the link. You can look at it while we talk. Great. In fact, I can open it for you. If you can see, on the left-hand side, you have um, all the pages, starting with the frontispiece, mm. beautiful frontispiece. Actually, it starts with the velvet cover, and then it goes on, and you can see every single page and zoom in. Gorgeous. Okay, we have a few more questions, but it's hard to believe that we are basically already out of time. Yeah, it's my fault. So, well, but I, want, I do want to ask one more thing because I was intrigued by this and someone else asked it, which is on Oppenheim's painting that you showed us with the family, with the soldier coming home for Shabbat, you mentioned um, the Shabbat lamp as the predecessor to candles. Can we pull that slide up again? And can you point, at, can you point it out to us? Yes, let the slide. Because I, I think I see what looks like challah, although I'm not sure. Yes, challah, and then you probably see a glass uh, kiddush cup, uh, presumably. So the lamp, uh, I'm glad that you asked this question, Laura, because uh, as part of the Schusterman gift, we have two hanging Shabbat lamps. Mm. Uh, sometimes they were made of brass, others of silver, but that was... Um, for a long time before the candles, you know, the candlesticks came along. That was the main uh, way to lit for Shabbat. Not only that, it was originally a medieval, non-Jewish way to, to, you know, to, to lit a room. Uh, and I believe that from probably the 14th century, 15th century onwards, it, it remained only with Jewish families. It, it became a, a specifically Jewish object but it was born just as a hanging lamp to to light 
to light a room. I never knew that, but it totally makes sense. So we have two. So maybe we, one day we can uh, uh, display That'd be great. Them. Or maybe we can discuss them as well. Oh, thank you. Thank we, you so much for having me. And uh, uh, stay well. And uh, I hope to see you all soon at the, at the museum in the flesh. Ab absolutely. And, and just so everyone knows that um, when we do our Hanukkah celebration with the museum, it will be on Wednesday, December 9th. It will not be an in-person event, but we are doing a virtual Hanukkah celebration that will be quite lively and exciting. So I hope you'll join us online for that. Um, and well before then, just so everyone knows, Monday, this Monday, August 10th, we have glass artist Sid Hutter joining us for JLive Art. And on Tuesday, August 18th, you are in for a treat with JLive Music with Yeko El Male, who is an incredible violinist. Uh, klezmer and otherwise. Um, and of course, last but not least, as the J Arts tagline says, let culture connect us. J Live and other J Arts programming isn't possible without generous community support like yours. So if you like what you see, please consider making a gift. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.